Shall we pray? Shall we turn to our God in prayer? Our Lord and our God, our Heavenly Father, we come once again to worship Thee, to gather together in Thy house, and to open the Word of God, and to praise Thy name, and to speak of Thy Son, and the truths of the Scriptures, and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. O Lord, we pray that there might be a power to the words, that the Holy Spirit might take the Word of God and apply it in the hearts. O Lord, we do pray for this, and we ask these things for thy glory and through Christ. Amen. 293 is our first hymn this evening. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. Shall we stand to sing? 293. Shall we turn to Ephesians chapter 2, Epistle to the Ephesians chapter 2, and we read the whole chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, 
among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace he are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and to good works, which God hath before ordained, that we shall walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall or partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. And I built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. We'll sing our next hymn, 396, 396. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Shall we stand to sing this hymn? 396.
Good evening. Welcome to the evening service. This evening our pastor will be preaching. We pray now that the Lord will draw close to each one of us and bless us as we meet together in his name. Just a reminder that if you need to take children at all, then please make use of the crash facilities. Uh, these are the best access by going through the door to my right and turning left along the link corridor through into the church hall. With uh, many of the weekly meetings being suspended now until September, uh, just to mention those which are continuing, on Wednesday at 7.30pm is the church Bible study and prayer meeting, and on Saturday at 10.30 is the open door meeting. And then next Sunday, God willing, uh, Jeff Gilbert will be preaching. Also next Sunday, uh, the Welsh Language Church, Carbillet Rath, will meet here in the chapel, and the preacher will be Alan Hyam. And then at 5.15, through to approximately 5.45 in the afternoon, there will be a time of prayer which takes place here in the chapel. Just two more additional notices. Firstly, Christian Worship Camp. That's for high school aged children. And that takes place at Woodcroft Christian Centre near Chepstow. It's been held in the last week of the school holidays. That's Monday the 26th through to Saturday the 31st of August. There are these booking forms which are in the entrance hall. So if you know of anyone who might like to uh, avail themselves of these... Uh, please help yourself. I think I've been told that uh, the, the places for girls and young ladies are full, but there are places left for boys uh, stroke young men. Uh, just finally, our next gospel preaching rally, and it'll be our, te- our church's 10th anniversary, is on Saturday the 7th of September. The preacher will be Pastor Malcolm Watts of Emmanuel in Salisbury. Please remain seated now as we see our next hymn. That's hymn 639. 639, during which time the stewards wait upon us for the collection.
Shall we turn to God again in prayer? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we come in the name of the Saviour once again before thee and to pray now, O Lord, for thy grace and thy blessing upon us as we continue to worship thee. We come, O Lord, to honour thee, thou, the eternal God, uh, the, the one who is high and lofty, the one who is holy, and the thrice holy God. We think of and try to think of the splendour and majesty of thy person. But Lord, our imaginations are poor and they stumble and they fail. But O oh Lord, we find help and we come to the word of God and the Spirit takes that word to our heart and we begin to contemplate uh, the glory of our God. And we know something of these things in our heart even, uh, that we are partakers of divine nature. Lord, we pray. Now, this evening, uh, bring us into these heavenly things. Uh, speak to us of the truths of the scriptures and the truths of, of God of man, God and man, and the gospel and uh, the scriptures and the revealed truth of God. Uh, Lord, approach our hearts and uh, we pray that uh, we might uh, find that uh, stamp of God upon our heart as we come now this evening uh, to worship thee, that none of us might go uh, away uh, without blessing. Uh, we might not be careless in our worship of, the, worship of thee now, O Lord, and uh, we might not wander in our minds or uh, think of earthly things, but rather uh, be compelled by the Holy Spirit uh, to think of heavenly things and give thee the glory especially for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we think this evening now of the gospel uh, which we are about to preach and which is preached uh, throughout the land, uh, either this morning or this evening. And, O oh Lord, we thank thee for the gospel. Uh, it is a great gospel. It is great from uh, every perspective and every angle. It is great from the view of a holy heaven and a sinful earth and the mercy shown to men and women. It is a great gospel from the view of Calvary where we see the Son of God who became the Son of Man and there he suffers uh, on our behalf taking our sins and shame and releasing us uh, from the power of sin and the guilt of sin. Lord, we thank thee. Uh, we pray now this evening that a solemnity may come over us and a joy as well, that these things may be married together, a trembling joy even, uh, as is often said, uh, that we might rejoice and yet, O oh Lord, be full of awe and reverence uh, with these great truths which we handle. Lord, help us. Uh, help us handle them correctly, uh, that whether preached or listened to, uh, whether sung or in fellowship. Uh, we ask, O oh Lord, for thy benediction upon us this evening. We pray especially for those who have no saviour and redeemer, who are in their sins and are not forgiven. Uh, their sins are not washed away. Uh, their heart is full of darkness. Uh, they cannot see thee, O oh Lord, the glory of the gospel. Uh, they are indeed looking towards the world and the darkness of the world with longing eyes instead of gazing upon Christ. O oh Lord, we pray for them, uh, that they, O oh Lord, might be shamed uh, by uh, their behaviour and might repent of it and might give thee the honour, but particularly might come in repentance and belief in Jesus Christ, might enter the kingdom now this evening, to enter the redeemed, the family of the redeemed. O oh Lord, we pray, do this work. We know, Lord, thou and only thou art able to do this work. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou would do this work in our midst, and not only here, throughout the land. Father God, there is a need in our land. The churches, O oh Lord, need to be revived. Uh, the people of God uh, are struggling. Although we rejoice in the gospel, O oh Lord, uh, our hearts are heavy uh, with the state of the land and the, and the fewness uh, of those who are saved. We have much to thank for and rejoice in it. The gospel is still glorious. Oh, but Lord, our hearts ache uh, for the condition of our people. 
uh, and for the church as well. Lord, we pray, come and revive us. Send thy Holy Spirit, thy pure Spirit, into our midst. And, O Lord, establish again the gospel of old. Come, O Lord, and establish in our hearts too uh, the sanctification, uh, that he might make great progress, uh, that we might not, O Lord, uh, hold back uh, in our holiness and sanctification, but rather, O Lord, we might lean towards uh, holiness and not lean towards the world, uh, but press on with the things of God, that our hearts might be alert and eager, and uh, we might not only be alert and eager uh, in these things, but also in other departments too, uh, that we might uh, be bold in prayer as well and call upon thy name. Lord, we know that this world has a, an effect of dullness and, and the devil indeed would, would make our hearts uh, depressed and, and, and he would oppress us. But Lord, we pray that thou would uh, fill, us, fill us, O Lord, with, with, with energy and, and zeal and, and, and belief. And uh, we ask, O Lord, that uh, we might uh, be, be men uh, which are strong in our time. Uh, help us to understand the wiles of the devil and not be ignorant of his ways, uh, but, Lord, to uh, take measures to, to combat him and to, and to resist him and to look to thee. Particularly, we might look to thee, O Lord, uh, to look to Christ. Uh, this is the answer which is always before us. Uh, we try to look for solutions to our problems by uh, going to uh, the wise people of this world instead of, of looking to Christ and, and living for thy glory. And Lord, uh, we, we pray that we might uh, do this and find thee to be our all in all. Father God, we do pray now, come upon this service, uh, bring the sense of reality upon us, the reality of heaven and hell, uh, the reality of the dangers of sin and the world and the need and the desperate need to repent and believe today, uh, not tomorrow. Uh, there might be an urgency uh, before it is too late, um, before souls are snatched away and out of the hearing of the gospel they might believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, we bring these petitions before thee now and uh, ask that thou will be pleased to make our gathering together uh, a blessing and uh, we might know the uh, sweetness uh, of, of thy presence. And uh, we ask this for uh, the churches uh, represented here. And we think of the church in London and uh, as they worship now this evening, uh, Lord, draw near there uh, and souls might be saved and God might be glorified. We pray the same for ourselves and many other churches throughout the land. We ask for them again and throughout the world. Think about brothers and sisters throughout the world and how we love them in Christ. O oh Lord, remember thy people. This is the Lord's day. It is a good day. O oh, that it might be full of thee, O oh Lord, that thou might presence thyself in our midst and our hearts might rise in adoration and worship and cry indeed that worthy is the Lamb. Uh, give us a touch of that heavenly hymn um, that is sung in Revelation, and we might sing indeed praises of such nature uh, that our worship might be lifted up this evening, and we ask these things for thy glory and through Christ our Saviour. Amen. Nine hundred and thirty nine nine three nine Depth of mercy can there be mercy still reserved for me. Shall we stand to sing this hymn? Nine three nine.
Well, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 for our verse this evening. Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. But particularly the expression rich in mercy, that God is rich in mercy. Now I shall take a general view of this term rich in mercy as I was reading this verse a few weeks ago, uh, that a phrase just stood out, and it seemed to me like an ever-expanding phrase, rich in mercy. Where, where do I put a limit upon this phrase? And yet we must try to define it, but there's something uh, ever-expanding about it. It's, it's quite a, a large phrase, and as big as God himself, you could say, um, the mercy of God. God is full of mercy. He is rich in mercy. So I shall take a, a general view, try to capture some of those thoughts that came across my heart a few weeks ago. Uh, but in a more precise way, for a short while, let me just point out a few things here. The two phrases, two striking phrases in our verse, uh, rich in mercy and great love. You have rich mercy and great love. They're quite a combination, aren't they? Rich mercy and great love. And we must say that the great love of God is behind the rich mercy. There is a sequence, an order there. The great love is what um, moves, shall we say, the great mercy of God. And that's a thought in and of itself. And we shan't go down that line, uh, probably not. Uh, but I just mention it now. Uh, the great love of God, and what a love it must be, it must be a great love to be behind a rich mercy great love of God. Uh, these things are things for us to look into and discover, aren't they? And they're quite wonderful. But uh, also, if I can point out this word rich, uh, it carries the thought of abundance and overflowing. There's nothing miserly about this word. It's an overflowing word, and a word of, of abundance, rich. And uh, especially when we put it in the context of God, then it is a superabounding, isn't it? And greatly overflowing uh, beyond our imaginations. But let me just, first of all, introduce the thought of God being rich in mercy uh, with a concept of just general riches and wealth, um, rich men and women uh, with possessions. And uh, we, we, we might say regarding a man that, that, he, that when he's rich, he has a sufficiency. He most certainly has a sufficiency. Uh, indeed, he has more than sufficient if, if he is rich. Uh, we could say he has plenty, plenty and, and surplus and, and excess and, and would be in a position uh, to help others with his riches. He might not help others, but would be in a position to help others with his riches. But of course, when we come to the Lord, we're not only speaking about uh, richness in, in possessions. Uh, uh, the Lord is rich in all things, certainly rich in possessions. Um, he's rich in his attributes and all his attributes. But this thought of him being rich in mercy is a beautiful thought uh, because we are a people who need mercy. And the thought of God being rich in mercy when we are so needy is a very comforting and a very encouraging thought. Uh, we might feel our need and our desperateness, but this phrase comes with a note of, of hope for you, that God is rich in mercy. Uh, you might be a hopeless case or a desperate case, but God is rich in mercy. It's a wonderful phrase, a phrase for you to take hold of this evening. And most certainly, God has sufficient mercy. He's more than sufficient in mercy. He has surplus mercy, we could say, but this mercy is different to possessions. Uh, a rich man might keep his possessions or share them, but mercy is hardly mercy. If you keep it, uh, a compassionate heart that is compassionate within but doesn't reach out is, is hardly in the category of, of mercy, is it? Mercy is an outgoing word. Uh, so God, to be merciful, must, must show it. And so he's rich in showing mercy. That is a great hope for those of us who are here this evening who need mercy. But let's 
just divide this thought of rich mercy into two this evening. And uh, my thoughts are these, that this rich mercy uh, reaches downward, and i explain this in a moment. Uh, these are just my thoughts to the text. Uh, as I look at the passage and looked at verses 1 to 4, first of all, and then 5 to 8, uh, these thoughts came to me, uh, that this mercy reaches downwards and also reaches upwards too. But first of all, it reaches downwards. And there are two aspects of this reaching downward I want to touch upon. The first is this, that this mercy reaches down to save sinners. And compared with God, we are most definitely down there. Uh, God is in his holy heaven. And we are in this sinful world with sinful hearts. Uh, we little appreciate that, that distance. Uh, how holy heaven is, and sadly, we don't even appreciate how, how sinful we are and this world is. But let's ask the question, how far are we down as sinners? It's a question worth asking. Well, as I said, God is a holy God. He must look upon us in our sins as something which is vile and something which he recoils from. Now, we must say that because because. That is a fundamental truth for us to understand. And we won't understand this mercy unless we understand uh, that, that God would recoil that sin. And sin is seen as vile in his sight. And compared to his absolute and glorious burning holiness, uh, our sinfulness is so, so far down. Um, if nothing is done, our sins will sink us into hell itself. That's how far down we are. Now, somebody once said, I think it was uh, some famous preacher who said that anything above the lip of hell is a mercy. It's quite a thought, isn't it? And there's a truth in that. Anything for us above the lip of hell, the brim of hell, is a mercy. And he speaks, does it not, of how we deserve the judgment and we deserve hell. Our sins deserve hell. And we don't easily come to that position, do we? Uh, we tend to think lightly of our sins, and it takes something quite remarkable for us to see our sins worthy of hell and, and of judgment. Uh, but they are worthy of hell and judgment. Uh, there is a hell, and there is a judgment, and it's much to do with our sin. It's everything to do with our sin. Our sins deserve to be punished and, and to be judged. Now, of course, you might not have considered your sins very much, or very lightly thought of your sins. Uh, one of the hymns we sang this morning spoke of uh, and challenged those who think of sin lightly uh, and to look upon the cross and then see how serious sin is as we see Christ suffering for sins on the cross. Uh, but, but you might not have thought much about your sins or, or considered them to be very serious. Well, in this passage, uh, especially in the opening verses, uh, we are told that we are very close to the devil in our sinfulness. Um, far from God and close to the devil is the location we find ourselves. Uh, look at verse 2. We follow the course of this world, which is under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. You see that it's a terrible thing to say, but, but you know, if we're not with God, we are friends with the devil. And we shall share our eternity with the devil and the, and the demons uh, if nothing happens to us, nothing of a salvation nature happens to us. Look at verse 2 again. We describe as the children of disobedience and also in verse 3 as the children of wrath. Now these are insulting terms, there's no doubt. Children of disobedience. Um, what a way to describe us. These are terms to describe us. Uh, they, they summarize us. They summarize mankind and summarize us. Children of disobedience. We break the law of God. We don't do the will of God, obey the, will, uh, the, 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 the law of God. And, and we are children of wrath. Uh, the wrath is already upon us. Uh, we are candidates for the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Um, we see the link here, here, don't we, between disobedience and wrath. One goes into the other. Uh, our disobedience will lead to wrath, the wrath of God. 
and God will be angry with sin. But perhaps you think of your disobedience as mischievousness. Uh, with a twinkle in your eye, you might say, well, I'm a bit of a rebel. And we might joke about our sins. There's no such thought here. Disobedience runs into wrath. Uh, sometimes we make a joke about our sins, don't we? And try to pass them off and to say, well, you know, that's the way I am. A little twinkle in our eye. I'm a bit of a rebel, you know. And uh, we don't realize that we're joking about our sins. And, and the Bible in no way jokes about our sins. Uh, disobedience runs into wrath, we see here in verses 2 and 3. Uh, also, we find this language here that speaks of lust of the flesh and desires of the flesh. Now, surely we, we would not joke about uh, the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the flesh, although men do, of course, but surely if we are seriously searching God and looking for salvation, we would not joke about such things. Uh, we wouldn't say, oh, with a twinkle in our eye, oh, you know, the lust of the flesh. It's shameful, isn't it? Perhaps you don't joke about your sin, but quite likely you think lightly of your sin. And that's because you have never seen your sin. It is a problem, isn't it? It is a problem. Um, those who are the Lord's people, who are Christians here this evening, can all remember the difference in the view of sin in the time running up to their conversion and when they were converted. And there was a vagueness about it before. And then, in the period or the day or the hour they were converted, the clarity, the sin. You trembled at your sin, ashamed of your sin, trembled at, at the judgment of God. The truth is this, you see, that we are great sinners. We are great sinners. And I know men don't think down these lines, but the Bible confronts us with our sin. Uh, we sin from end to end, you might say, from the time we enter this world to the time we leave this world. What a catalogue of sin. I think when we are older and become older, we become perhaps more aware of this. Uh, in our youth, we just, life is before us, but then as experience mounts up and you look back upon your life, uh, certainly the Christian thinks like this. Maybe not the unbeliever, of course. But the Christian thinks like this, and he thinks, oh, my sin. Oh, my life of sin. What a long list of sins. What decades of sin. And we sin in all we do, in everything we do. And we realize that many of the, of the good things we do uh, are, are, are tainted and sinful, and pride creeps in. I know in Scotland they have a, a phrase when they pray, uh, forgive our sins in holy things. And, and even uh, for Christians, in, in holy things we sin, but certainly those who are not Christians, uh, all their good deeds oh, are so sinful, so full of pride. Uh, even when people are, shall we say, seemingly really genuine people and uh, very kind people, and yet it's strange, is it not, uh, those kind and good people don't respond to the gospel and they despise it. What's wrong there? Well, of course, it reveals their pride of heart. The pride is there. And of course, there are dark sins in our heart too. And no doubt, many dark sins. And if not indeed, actually in potential, what our hearts are capable of. And you know and I know what goes on in our hearts. And there are dark things there, no doubt about it. And we sin against a great God. So indeed, we are great sinners, a great God, who is our maker and creator. We sin against him. Well, we sin against each other, and we're not nice to each other, and that's for sure. But we sin against God, first and foremost. And that is our biggest problem. We've sinned against him. At the heart of all we do is this rebellion against his ways, and we sin in his face and against him. And we are even... Though the phrase is quite shocking, but it's true. We are God's haters. Now, why do I say such things? Well, to convince you, first of all, that you are sinners, but also to show you that God has reached into these depths to save us. And that's my particular interest now, this evening, that God has reached. Remarkable thought it is 
the holy God. Why, why should he have anything to do with us? But he has reached to these depths to save us. We just sung, haven't we? Depth of mercy. Can there be mercy still reserved for me? But depth of mercy. The mercy of God in dealing with us at all. And we might not want to get our hands dirty. Some of us are more particular that way than others. Some don't mind getting their hands dirty, but some of us don't like getting our hands dirty. We recoil. Well, those of us who don't like getting our hands dirty might see this picture better. A God, a holy God, should deal with us and, and handle us. It's a remarkable thing that he should do this. But we haven't yet captured the rich mercy and the depth of this rich mercy. This is part of it. But the second aspect is this. This reaching downward is found in Jesus Christ. And even Christ coming into this world is a rich mercy. We speak of God reaching down in mercy, but is a very particular way he reaches down with Jesus Christ and sends his beloved Son to become man and take our humanity and to be truly man and be one of us. And it's remarkable in and of itself that Christ, the Son of God, should be in this fallen world. We think of Christ in heaven and the glory. That's where he belongs. It's remarkably, he comes and is one of us in this world. But not particularly where you find our Lord Jesus Christ. You find him in the depths of Calvary. It's a different kind of depth there. The depths of Calvary. He came to this world to die on the cross for a particular reason. It is there he saves us. It is there he receives from sinners their sins. He was without sin, without blemish, without spot. The glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he was made sin for us that he receives in some way our sins. I say in some way, in a meaningful way. He receives our sins and takes them from us. This God does when we believe in Christ. Our sins are put on him and his righteousness is put on us. But our sins are put on him and the judgment falls upon him. And there on the cross there are depths. It is impossible for the preachers of the gospel to plumb the depths of Calvary. But we must try to describe the wonderful depth of mercy that Christ went to the cross, the depths of Calvary, and there he suffered agonies, both in body and in soul. And there were soul pains, you could say, soul anguish, as Christ suffered upon the cross. There the intensity of hell, the judgment of God came upon him. And we think of the great strength required to receive all that judgment, but Christ is strong to receive it. And yet it, no doubt, brought him down as well. And there, this strength, can we say, even though he was holding it, he was holding the suffering and dying is a, it's a remarkable kind of holding, isn't it? The strength to deceive our sins. It's, it's a strength that, that sinks him down into, into uh, the very judgment of God and the wrath of God. The wrath of God? Upon our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, because of our sins, the wrath came down upon him. Now we can see that God not only reached down into the horrible pit and miry clay uh, to save us. But Christ himself entered a horrible pit as well. Calvary is a horrible pit. And there, when you think of all the sinners and all their sins, and mighty Calvary in Christ, who, who can describe it? Who can describe it? He is the saviour of the world. He's the mighty saviour. Who else could do this, my friend? Who else could do it but Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the God-Man, the Mediator, Jesus Christ? Who else could do it? But there on the cross, he receives our sins and the judgment, and he removes it from us. That's what he does. There's great purpose in this. 
great meaning in this, that those who believe in him, their sins are put upon him and they are released. Oh, the mercy of God. It's, it's mercy at great cost to God. At great cost to Jesus Christ, particularly. Oh, we can only stand in awe at this attribute of God's mercy. Oh, may the Lord open our hearts. You find that, don't you? And I'm speaking particularly to Christians, but oh, may those who are not believers here this evening suddenly see it also, uh, that you can sing many, many hymns, but sometimes a phrase just opens out Calvary before you, oh, the greatness of God, and you see it. Your heart is thrilled. Oh, what all oh, there is in the mercy of God reaching down to us, reaching down to the horrible pit, but also Christ was in a horrible pit and the miry clay, a place called Calvary. It is a glorious place, but also it is a dark place. And there our Saviour suffered for us. Oh, we can only thank him. We can only thank him. We can imagine what it must have been like, but Christ went through the reality of it. The reality of it. He went through it. But this rich mercy also reaches upward as well. It's a mercy we are saved at all and escape the judgment. We don't deserve salvation. We deserve judgment. But those who believe in Christ escape the judgment and have salvation. This salvation is not just being saved from our sins and the judgment upon our sins or on the everlasting judgment. But also, there's something else in this passage we see here in verse 6 and verse 7. He speaks of heavenly places. The apostle speaks of heavenly places for ages to come as well. He speaks of being joined to Jesus Christ. What kind of mercy is this? Who would have thought that people like ourselves would be joined to such a one as the Lord Jesus Christ? You talk of privilege, but what a privilege. What a remarkable privilege that I, who deserve judgment and hell, that my soul should be joined to the person of Jesus Christ and to be in the heavenly places. Who would have thought that people like ourselves, and this phrase speaks of having one foot in heaven already because we are in Christ and Christ is in heaven. It's a sense we are in the heavenly places already, but we shall, we shall have two feet in heaven as well. We shall be in the heavenly places altogether. We shall be with Christ. We are there already, but we shall be there in completeness. We shall be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall be with the eternal God in the ages to come. It is quite remarkable. You think of the beginnings. God created the world and created man. And sin came in and ruined it all. But oh, that initial happiness and pleasure, God and man, creator and created, the joy of knowing God, of being partakers of his blessing, but then ruined by the fall, but in Christ, brought back, brought back. And all the joys of Eden before the fall will be ours, but more in Christ. And what a privilege to be joined to the second person of the Godhead and to have that now, those who are Christians. You know this word mercy? You tend to think of mercy reaching downwards only, and I, and I struggle myself to think of mercy reaching upwards, but, but it is a mercy, isn't it? It's a remarkable mercy. It's a rising mercy. It's a abounding mercy because not just that we spare judgment, but we have heaven and have God. This word mercy somewhere changes into glory, doesn't it? It's a very high mercy, a remarkable mercy. Mercy. What a mercy. Mercy is a lovely word, but our concept of mercy maybe comes short of the fullness of the truth here. Mercy. To be reconciled to God and for God to, to love us and to own us and to bring us to himself into heaven and for us to be the objects of his love and for us particularly to glorify him. 
for that to be correct, instead of living for ourselves, that, that then we have hearts which glorify him for which we were created, and everything is put right. Everything is put right. Everything is wrong in this world, more or less, isn't it? Apart from the common grace of God. But everything is put right. Oh, I can only say that before you tonight, before you this evening, is the expanse of God's mercy. A rich mercy, abounding mercy, a mercy that goes downwards and upwards, a mercy that defies words. Now, if you refuse this rich mercy in Jesus Christ, it will be to your eternal shame. It's a strange thing, isn't it, that people don't want mercy. Isn't it a strange thing? It speaks volumes about our sin, does it not? That, that, that we don't want mercy it speaks a lot about our hearts. Oh, God, have mercy upon you. And God, have mercy upon us all. That, that is our heart. We don't want mercy. But I trust I'm addressing some here tonight who are drawn to this mercy. You want God. You want to be reconciled to your maker and creator. You want him to be your savior. Perhaps you have not come so far because you've harbored some thoughts of self-help. This is a strange one because this is not only found generally, but sometimes found in those who know better or should know better. It's strange how it comes in. We harbor thoughts of self-help. It creeps in. This is the besetting sin, is it not, of the whole world, uh, that we can win salvation ourselves. We will gain it. We don't need mercy. I can remember years ago a uh, Christian speaking to an unbeliever. He had a tragedy, tragedy in his life. And this Christian just said naturally, when I was saved. That's all he said, when I was saved. And uh, I knew this unbeliever and spoke to him many hours. And how dare he? He said, how dare he? I was offended by that word. What do you mean save? We don't need saving. And that is the attitude of many. But it can creep in in all kinds of ways. This idea of self-help, you haven't realized it's mercy you need. The word grace, of course, is undeserved mercy. We don't deserve mercy. It's undeserved mercy. Hey, God gives us this mercy, this grace. Well, perhaps you have not come because you thought it could not be that simple. And you thought you might have to work it out and might have to, again, self-help, but do something yourself. Things have to be resolved and so on and not realize the simplicity of it. It's mercy. It's mercy. Yes, there is a way to this mercy, which I'll mention again in a moment. But it's mercy. And you think, oh, no, it's not that simple. That's because of your sin. It is that simple. It is mercy. Perhaps you were hesitating because you thought your sin too great. Oh, if you only knew my sin, it would shock the congregation. I have some dark sins. My sins make me blush as well. Oh, my hypocrisy is so great. God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. In many ways, you go in the right way, aren't you, when you go down the road and being shocked at your sin. But then it can take a wrong turn, and you think, oh, my sin is too great. No, no, it cannot be. You're talking about God here and the great riches of God's mercy, his great mercy, and his mercy reaches out to you. But perhaps you are hesitating because you thought God was all wrath and had no desire to, to save sinners and thought, God thunders judgment and, and there's no salvation for me and did not realize he's a God of mercy and he reaches out to you. Oh, the mercy of, of offering mercy. It's remarkable. It's one thing that there is mercy, but God leans towards you with mercy. He sends preachers. He established churches and he sends missionaries and the Bible overflows with mercy. It warns us, yes, but in order for us to come to Christ and to come to our senses. But perhaps you have held back because you thought you're outside the scope of his interest. You're insignificant. And God's not interested in you. Oh, how wrong you are. What a God he is. 
He sees all the small people of the world. He sees the lame, the blind, the deaf, those back in the time of Christ which were ignored and despised even. He sees them all. He sees those who are not important, those individuals who are not part of the, the clique or the group, who are on their own, who are lonely. God, which is out in mercy to you. God is all seen, and his eye is full of mercy. And so before you tonight is a rich mercy, an abounding and a flow, overflowing mercy. And I would say also it is a liberal mercy. It is a liberal mercy. Our hymns reflect this, don't they? They speak and sing of the mercy of God. My dear friend, if you are not a Christian, hear the testimony of the word of God. Hear the hymns. Hear the people of God speak and hear the preacher speak. That God is a merciful God. He is merciful to those who come to him. And how important that is. I don't think that God will be merciful to those who go away from him and to continue their sins. There is a very simple but a very important way to this mercy and it makes perfect sense when you think about it. It's called repentance and faith. God doesn't, shall we say, go against your will but rather calls you And so you must respond to him. And that responding is repentance. And that is a turning away from the world and going towards God and believing in Christ and throwing your lot upon him. A child can understand that. But you know it's strange that people can want to be saved and still go the other way. I want to be saved. They're drawn by the world. Oh, may God have mercy upon you if that is the case. Oh, that you might now realize what's happening to you. You're going backwards into the world and the voice of the gospel is getting fainter and fainter. Oh, understand how dangerous is your situation. The mercy of God is great, but you must repent and believe. And this is the way. And God even helps you there. You might say, how can I repent and believe? This passage speaks of the gift of God and faith being the gift of God repentance and faith he helps you I think we had a wonderful illustration of this in the Welsh service a few weeks ago when my brother was preaching on the man with a withered hand and Christ commanded him to to reach forth his hand well, when you think about it well what do you mean why should he bother he knows he's got a withered hand he knows he can't but Christ says reach forward And this man must have responded and reached. And as he reached, the power of God came into his arm. And so it is in faith. As you repent and as you believe, the power of God will take you and take you into Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Those who truly repent and believe will find God to be rich in mercy for the ages to come. Look at verse 7. Isn't it a wonderful verse? That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Oh, don't mistake the lovely tones of the gospel. Don't mistake them. Don't miss them. Yes, I know this passage speaks much of the children of disobedience and of wrath For those who will respond to the grace of God, the mercy of God, then indeed these words are for you. He draws, he calls, he calls you to himself. Then even this evening, come to God through Jesus Christ and prove indeed he is rich in mercy. And your heart will sing forever and forever, will it not? Forever and forever. You'll not only sing in this service. You'll not only sing for the days you have remaining in this world, but you shall forever. Your heart will be full of praise to God that he is rich in mercy. Well, what a poor job we've made of this phrase this evening, rich in mercy.
there is so much more, is there not? May we all prove more of this truth in our lives, that God is rich in mercy. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we do ask now for thy help as we come to the end of this service and pray, O Lord, that these words might find a home in our hearts. And for those who are not saved, O Lord, we pray, here's another Lord's Day. We do not know what, what the morrow brings. We ask, O Lord, that they might believe and believe quickly uh, before the darkness close in, closes in. O oh, Lord, they might know the light of God. Uh, they might know that Christ indeed uh, is the life and the resurrection. Uh, he is indeed uh, the great saviour of the souls of men and women. And they might prove it, O oh Lord. They might believe. Oh, we do cry for that power to come into their heart. We pray, O oh Lord, that they might even now, uh, in their weakness, uh, repent and believe and find, to be, find it to be the power of God uh, to salvation. And we ask these things and pray these things for thy glory, Lord, and through Christ our Saviour. Amen. We'll complete our evening service with hymn number 653, 653. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Shall we stand?
Shall we pray? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.